Hey everyone, this is Hedgie. Uh, welcome to Cooking with Hedge Picks. And this, of course, is the infamous Pink Pig. She just wanted to say hello because she's missed you all. It's Saturday, and we are going to be having quite the lineup of uh, food cooked today. Hey, Tina Bug! Oh, thank you so much for the sub! Tina Boo, lol, Tina Boo, yes, yeah, Siddick 33, love. <laughs> Thank you for the renewed subscription, Tina Bug. How are you today? We are going to have quite the lineup of what we're cooking. I am, um, when I met my mother-in-law for the first and only time, uh, she came over to our place and flew from England to see us. And one of the things she made was cauliflower cheese, which is, I am doing much better, thank you. Um, she made a dish called cauliflower cheese, and it's kind of a beloved side dish in England. Uh, we have cauliflower that we make, and then we pour a little bit of cheese sauce on it, or sometimes hollandaise. Uh, they go a step further. They make a good cheddar sauce. And they pour it not only over it, but through it. They coat it like it was, um, like it was uh, macaroni and cheese. And then they take and they bake it in the oven. And, oh, it's so good. Oh, that is just so good. Uh, there's other seasonings in there. And in the course of this, you will be getting her recipe for cauliflower cheese which I will also throw up on Discord. The recipes haven't gone up yet, but they will shortly afterwards. Uh, so I am combining the cauliflower cheese that my husband loves and I love with an American chicken pot pie. Hey, Tara! How are you doing today? I'm glad you came in to visit us. I am getting started right away on the cauliflower. This is a rather small head of cauliflower, but... Uh, you can buy florets already, you can buy frozen, whatever you want to do, but if you're using fresh, which I'm doing here, you need to clean out its core, and then you need to, uh, you need to cut it into florets and get it cooking, huh? Oh dear, I'm sorry for that people, we're dropping frames, I don't know why. Um, we'll press on and hope it gets better, I guess. Andrew, you just decide what you want to do. Um, the other plan is after we put, well, we have the chicken pot pie in the oven cooking, I will be making chicken fried steak and gravy. So, yes, Tara always has wine. It's kind of a tradition with us when we're cooking. Uh, we would have drinks while pots were simmering on the stove. It was a lovely, lovely thing. Um, we're looking at probably moving to within 20 minutes of where Tara is. And uh, so you guys may very well be meeting my partner in crime, my cousin Tara. And um, we may very well be cooking together on stream. So that will be fun. Yep, 20 minutes away. Spokane Valley is only 20 minutes from where she lives. <laughs> A new location. <laughs> well, honey, if she's out here, she can help with the prep and cleanup. Okay. Does that suddenly make it worth it? Okay, so this is the inside of a cauliflower. Sometimes they're pretty hard to cut apart, and I don't want to lose a finger, so I'm always kind of tentative at this point. Once you get the core out, and the core is the icky, extraneous bits of the cauliflower, you are left with what look like little trees, and that's the florets. And I am going to start water on, hoping it starts to boil. If we lose you guys briefly, 
I do apologize, but uh, Andrew is doing his stream, ma stream magic. Sorry, I turned my head a little too far away there, I think. Um, trying to make sure that we have a better stream. All right, I am going to turn this on and find the lid to put on it so I bring the water. To, well, it's not the lid, but it's a lid. That's good enough, I suppose. So, we then take it, it pretty much breaks itself up, so then all you need to do is try to get a pretty standard sized florets, so it goes to the whole cooking idea. Now, if I was going to put this in a long cooking casserole, I would probably just make it so that uh, I put it in there raw, but because this is going into a pot pie, which really all you're doing is cooking the, um, you're just cooking the, the crust pretty much. Everything else that goes into it is already cooked or at least half cooked. I am going to give these a bit of a poach for uh, 10 minutes in boiling water uh, with a little bit of salt in it. And like I said, I'm going to make sure that this is an edible, biteable size since it's going into a pot pie and you're not going to be cutting it up with a knife and fork or anything like that. It's going to be in bites of yummy pie covered in uh, cheese sauce. Um, Andrew has already claimed this pie for England and he says it's his mother's uh, cauliflower cheese recipe and since by extension I have put that into a, my pot pie that instead of my pot pie assimilating her cauliflower cheese recipe it is the other way around and i have to admit that is kind of the british way they are planting a flag if i don't have a flag they win so that's the british colonial things of course so this is going to go not into a standard pie container it's not going to be in a pie pan i am actually going to cook it in an eight by eight baking dish uh, and then covering it with um, pastry. So it will still have the pot pie lid, but it will be in the uh, confines of an 8 by 8 container, so it'll actually have more filling and stuff than a, a pot pie would. So that makes Andrew happy. And as you can see, you just cut these out of the way and doesn't really matter if you score them at all. Nobody's going to be looking at how pretty your florets are. Bust that center out of there like that. Andrew is retreating with the small, annoying, whiny dogs, so Olivia will go outside. Yeah, uh... We are looking at moving um, next month, somewhere in the middle to the end of next month, if we can get an apartment fast enough, yeah, because they are raising our rent here and we can't afford it. So we are trying to uh, move and we're looking at moving all the way across the state. When we do, we'll be down for a couple days, of course. Um, I will give you guys lots of notice in that case. Um, there is also another potential change. Andrew has a job interview for a work-by-home call center type job, and if he gets that, it will definitely impact my streaming schedule because he can't do two things at once. He's a wonderful man, and he's capable of amazing things, but being two people is not one of them. So we'll have to see what his schedule is and work around that. It's just fine and handy. I'll still be streaming. Yeah. I'm still cooking for you all and cooking for everyone else and hopefully I'll be cooking with my cousin Tara there and there will be lots of laughter and stories. And it won't all be just from me babbling at you. So, uh, this pie um, 
needs you need to preheat the oven to 375 so while you're doing the vegetable prep on it and cooking the chicken which I will get to eventually uh, you need to have the oven preheating to 375 it's a it's a rather warm oven but like I said it's just to cook the uh, crust so you're only going to be cooking it for 20 to 30 minutes um, you could use mostly um, frozen vegetables for this and it would be a lot quicker of a prep but uh, I like fresh vegetables better so I'm using fresh vegetables here and what I need to do now is get these into the water which hasn't yet come to a boil but that's fine I'm going to add a little bit of salt to the water And this takes between 5 and 10 minutes to cook. What's going on in the background from my parents? They're both a little hard of hearing, so it could be they're just talking to each other. It's doing it in the hallway instead of their bedroom. All right, and now I use my handy-dandy board scraper, which I absolutely adore. Vegetables I am prepping. Need to finish the cauliflower before I can start cooking. It's just a matter of quite room on. On my uh, plate. <laughs> if I end up opening a tasting room here, we'll need foods for functions. Just saying. Well, you know it'll be fun to uh, be cooking for that. I've got lots of recipes for little bits and, and bobs. We Crab stuffed mushroom caps. I know I've missed those. If you haven't. Yeah, my cousin Tara is really into wine. Yeah, it sounds like she might be talking about being attached to a wine cellar or selling wine herself. Who knows? Uh, we'll find out. If we end up with a tasting uh, room, then uh, it'll definitely be a tourist spot, which may possibly, highly likely, get some uh, business from me uh, and advertisement as well. The second half of what we're making today is going to be chicken fried steak. And that is made with cube steak, which is a tough cut of meat, which is then cubed. Cubed, I'm making little fingers here. Cubed. And what that is, is a steak that, ha that they run through a blade system. And it cuts both sides of the blades all at once. And um, it cuts up all of those fibers that make it tough. And this is a, a pretty standard cut for a, a uh, chicken fried steak. You can also take and pound it yourself. But, you know, I'm sorry, I just like a little bit more of the easiness than what it goes. This is going to take, in addition, to cauliflower. It's going to have celery in it. And we're going to have a potato. We're going to have a zucchini, because I like zucchini. Anytime I can sneak more vegetables in, on, I'm too quiet. Uh, okay, I'll try talking louder. Is that better? Uh, this is also going to have, anytime I can get more vegetables into Andrew, I'll do it. And putting it in a pot pie seems to be an excellent way to do it. So this is going to have two sticks of celery in it. 
and I'm going to put it on a fairly fine dice because I don't want to have big chunky bits in there of celery. I'm already going to have big chunky bits of cauliflower. And that is the primary flavor in this. It's going to be cauliflower and cheese and seasoned chicken. And uh, it's also going to have mushrooms in it because I like mushrooms. And any chance to stuff a mushroom in something? There we go. Now, I have joked in the past, Tina, that uh, I cook so much, and Tara can, can you know, definitely swear by this, I tend to cook so much at one time that I always have leftovers, and I have joked that uh, there are people I know of that sell their leftovers as a side dish, or side uh, business, as kind of a side catering job. And I joked when some people were saying, send me some of that, that I would freeze my leftovers in single-serving containers and send them out to people dry ice. And uh, at this point, that's still a joke. Maybe it'll come true. Who knows? I'd have to look into it. But it could be something I'd look into in the future. So we've got celery in here that is going to be cooked with the onion. And it's going to have sweet onion in it. And I was originally going to put uh, rainbow carrots in it as well, but we don't have rainbow carrots, so I'm dropping those from the recipe. Add in some other veggies if you like. You can, if you don't like zucchini, put in some peas. You know, little green peas, sweet sweet peas would be really nice in this too. You could put corn in it if you wanted. Uh, I have some doubts over the corn with the. Uh, I have some doubts over the corn with uh, cheese sauce, but maybe it would work. Come and visit us, then. Come out to the coast. Well. Where we wouldn't actually be at the coast. If I'm in the Spokane Valley, I'm about out of the state of Washington and hanging out near Idaho, which is where my cousin actually lives. And we'd be within a hop, skip, and a jump of each other, which would be fabulous. I love cooking with her every week. Uh, we have got one potato in here, and that is being conservative because it's still not boiling, but close to it. You don't want to, once upon a time, Tara and I used to cook together uh, once or twice a week, sometimes Saturdays and Wednesdays on a good time, and we, I started by teaching her to make soups, and soups are always fun, love soups, but I decided to make a sausage and potato soup once and we got a little container like this which is a three-quart saucepan and I wanted it to be full of potatoes. I didn't want it to be full of potatoes but I wanted the soup to have a significant potato presence because it is after all a cream of potato soup in essence. Well um, I started with three big potatoes and I thought that's not so much but when I put them in the pot, it filled the entire pot to the lid. <laughs> and, uh, we had to upgrade to a different size pot. Tara just laughed at me because uh, I have a knack for whatever it is I'm cooking. Whatever container I use, I will fill it. And <laughs> what can I say? It's just a talent. <laughs> potato story. So that's why I'm only using one potato because this is going to have lots of other vegetables in it. Uh, I don't need to fill it up with potatoes to have a potato presence. Since it's going to have zucchini and onion and celery and lots and lots of cauliflower and I've got a big bunch of uh, mushrooms here and the mushrooms are going to be a definite. Oh, that's what that hissing sound is. Okay. Lots of mushrooms in it too, so I don't need to absolutely load this thing with potato because it's not the star, it's the cauliflower and the chicken. But I'm putting in lots. 
pots and vegetables that you would find in a pot pie. That's different. Did you mean to do that, sweetheart? Okay. Normally he has control of my computer during uh, streams and for some reason he got out of Team Viewer. Don't know why. Apparently he didn't mean to do it. So now I will put these vegetables in here. As I am going to be soft cook for I make it in the filling. So this is a zucchini and it's a little bit of a scarred up fella, so what I need to do is just cut those parts off. Oh, look at that. We have reached a boil. So I've got about five minutes, probably. Use that. And then I am just going to give this, I'm going to quarter this and slice it. Because I am trying to get all the bits small enough so that you're not eating just a big piece of zucchini in one bite and a big piece of potato in the next. Not hearing me at all. Ah, uh, I'm seeing my thing. Huh. Okay. Uh, I am gonna have to have my husband get me a stick of butter. I don't know why it's not out here. Maybe I didn't put it on the on the prep list. Probably that's what happened, and that would be my fault. If you don't have one of these already, I definitely recommend that uh, you get yourself one of these board scrapers. It just comes in so handy. And if you do a lot of things with breads and doughs, um, then it helps you cut that up, and that's pretty awesome too. And that's actually what it is made for, although you can... Actually, like I said, this does have a blade to it, and it does cut vegetables as well. So, it is a multi-use implement. I don't know how I lived without one before. just scoops everything from your board and you don't have multiple hands and things falling out because it works like a little shovel and that's pretty awesome. So, all right. And it's more washing up. Absolutely, that was definitely part of the plan. <laughs> I'm going to have a little sip of my cranberry juice here. Okay. Now we are going to move on to the onion. That's the last thing I have to cut up. And that should allow the cauliflower to be cooked. So I cut off the uh, stem end, which is the end where the little shoots come out. And I leave the root end on so that it holds it together. And I cut it in half through the root. And the root will hold it together while I'm dicing.
just peel off the outer layer here. So you don't want to have that onion skin and it's not a nice thing to eat. It's rather papery. There. Now, if you were going to be doing gardening or something like that, these little bits and pieces like that would go really well in for a mulch. Uh, if you have chickens, uh, the chickens would be very happy to eat your little bits. We got to take off. Okay. See you later, Tara. Thanks for coming in to see at least the beginning. Come back and watch the VOD when you're done. They were planning on going to their neighbors when I let them know I was going to be streaming. So I was hoping we could catch a little bit more of the stream, but it turns out it is what it is. So. Anyway, so now I am going to dice the onion. And I am going to add an extra slice in here. Because I want the dice to be a little bit smaller than I usually put in. So I've got it cut into three there. And then it's just the same from then. You take and cut down into it. Just a little layers in here so that it cuts it up to the size you want. And lay across the end here. fingers out of the way, demonstrating why I got fast cutting. The cauliflower should be almost done. I will check them after. This is going to use, you can use chicken breast if you want, and it will use about four medium-sized chicken breasts. I have got four large chicken thighs because I like the flavor of dark meat better. It's got a higher fat content, has more flavor. It's just kind of a win-win. Um, that's why dark meat is awfully popular when you're carving a turkey. So... I need to skin off that because I do not want it going into my actual dish. So now I've got the onion in here too. I've got that, you can't see it. I've got a big bowl of vegetables here. And, all right, now I am going to take this hot burner. And remove the lid just as carefully, and I can tell actually that the cauliflower is cooked. Take one out. It's not a hard white anymore, although that probably doesn't show up. It's turned slightly translucent, and I can slide the knife in here very easily. Yep. That was closer to 10 minutes, but that's fine. Uh, I'm going to have my husband come and drain this now for me, if he would be so kind. Wow, that's actually kind of hitting my support. Thank you. And I'll need the pan back. A little bit farther away from the support because it's hitting the support and I don't want to heat up the support. Alright, I'm going to take a little bit of butter. No, no, just uh, set it here.
take uh, two tablespoons of butter. I will put it here in the pan, along with a little bit of oil to make it so that the butter's burn temperature raises. Uh, butter has a very low burn temperature, and you really don't want your butter burning because that will make the entire dish just taste nasty. So, I am going to get this around and work it so it's melting. And then I am going to give a bit of a saute to the vegetables. Mainly so that we cook the onion and the zucchini a little. We cook the celery a bit too, just so that it's just a couple minutes. Um, so that it is, call it sweated. It means that it's softened and it doesn't take so long to cook. And there go the vegetables into my pan. And I am not going to season them until I do all of the vegetables together. Mom, what are you? And we'll get those cooking. This is done over a medium high temperature. I've got the potatoes in here, so they're going to get a little bit cooked ahead too. Probably not a bad idea. Now, if this was a normal chicken pot pie, I would be making chicken gravy with this. And it wouldn't have any so my mother wouldn't be able to, my mother can't have this, she's allergic to dairy. So I am going to add seasonings to this that I wouldn't normally add, such as salt. Because everything needs a little seasoning or it just doesn't taste right. So, this will cook about five minutes, what we're looking at here. And meanwhile, now that I've got these going, I am going to take my cauliflower out and put it into a waiting pot here, which is where I'm going to put all the vegetables and filling back into and going to mix it up with the um, cheese sauce before I put it into the baking dish. So I am going to wipe out the inside of this pan because I am going to be making cheese sauce in this pan next uh, after I cook the chicken. Okay. So this can go to the side for now. I can hear the sizzling of the pan here as things are starting to cook. This is only going to cook in the oven for about 25-30 minutes. Uh, like I said, am I really going down in volume again? Okay. Uh, anyway. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is going to cook in the oven only for about 25 to 30 minutes. It will make sure everything is all heated up together. And it will make sure that uh, the crust is nice and golden brown. What we need to do when we're thinking about uh, doing a chicken pot pie is uh, whether you're going to do a two crust or a single crust, um, you can cook uh, you can do, you can cook it with a two pot, with a two crust, and it'll probably add maybe ten minutes to your cooking time. But I am actually only going to put it over the top, and uh, that's just a, a choice. It's more of a casserole, really, at this point, because it's not going to be in a pie dish. It is going to be in this beautiful Pyrex baking dish, eight by eight, and. 
that will, if I was doing a double crust, that would help it keep from burning. Um, I really like Pyrex. Uh, my favorite baking dishes have been Pyrex. My mother's uh, pie pans, her pie uh, pans that she uses are Pyrex. And they still sell them in the grocery store, even though hers are probably 50 years old, if not more. Same design, it's fluted on the edge. They're absolutely beautiful. Uh, they make a 10 inch pie, and that is just a wonderful, wonderful um, pie dish. The, the thicker uh, material actually makes it so that uh, your pie crust has less chance of burning on the bottom. So that's, that's a benefit, anything that can do that. If you have something that has to cook a long time when you're cooking the pie, if you were, for instance, just throwing these in uh, frozen to save time, use a rot rotisserie chicken, shred it up, or get pre-cooked chicken, which you can get in the frozen food areas. I would hope you would try to thaw the, fr the chicken first, but because um, it would just make sure that it was actually hot when you took it out. Um, you would probably increase the cooking time to about 30 to 40 minutes instead of 20 to 30. And you would probably have to wrap the edges of your pie uh, crust so that it didn't burn. Um, it can get overly brown and unappetizing if you have to cook it longer than about 30 minutes. So, or if you use a higher temperature. Um, this is cooking up nicely. While I'm doing this, I am going to tell you a little bit about our future here. I am going to be making manicotti uh, at some point upcoming, and I may be doing that, probably will be doing that with a chicken manicotti with a nice, uh, it's a cream sauce basically. I may do seafood manicotti, depending on what exactly I can get. It may be uh, cod and salmon and shrimp. I may throw some smoked uh, scallops in there, and uh, that would have a sour cream uh, dill sauce in it, and have a nice white cheese, and that's a really lovely recipe. Um, I will be looking at making some of the soups that are seasonal. We've been having a hard time getting good mushrooms, but we're getting good mushrooms now pretty steadily, so I'm going to be making my chicken mushroom chowder, and that uses a couple different kinds of mushrooms and uh, chicken. It's in a nice cream sauce. It's got a little secret ingredient in there you really wouldn't guess is there. and. Uh, it is served piping hot and covered in grated cheese, so it's rich and creamy and mushroomy with seasoned chicken, and then it's got a lovely melted cheese on top with every bite. Yum, yum, yum. That is a big favorite. I will be making cod chowder upcoming. I had been intending to do it in the past, but I couldn't actually get the cod at the time. I've got the cod now, so that will probably actually be the next street, is cod chowder. Um, and that is a white chowder. It's, uh, you know, getting onto that, that's a pet peeve. They have uh, New England style clam chowder, and that is what everybody tends to think of as clam chowder. And it is a white sauce, it's got the seafood in it, it has uh, potatoes and seafood and onion and celery and carrot and depending on whether you're east coast or west coast, sometimes it has bacon in it. And then they have Manhattan clam chowder, which is done with a clam broth with tomato uh, juice in it or tomato sauce. And I'm sorry, that's not a chowder. It may have potatoes in it, it still has the clams, it has all the other ingredients, but it's in a red uh, broth, basically. That's not a chowder. That is a soup. 
<laughs> so uh, that was actually my grandfather's on my father's side's favorite. Uh, he liked the Manhattan style uh, clams rather than the New England. Uh, for that, if he liked, if he was going to have a white sauce and seafood, he liked oyster stew. Yeah. That may be something I show people how to make as well. Um, maybe take a vote on that. I know a lot of people don't like oysters, so I'm not sure how my husband feels about it. I know my mother and father detest it, so it may be just something for me. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I just have to find a way to make myself have a small batch, which will be very difficult. <laughs> but uh, you can use the same method for making um, shrimp chowder, clam chowders, making it's it's actually the stew is actually quite similar to um, a New England clam chowder, except it's got oysters in it instead of clams. I know I can't cook small, so I guess I'll have to hope that it freeze as well, or I'll be eating it two meals a day until it's gone. So I'm trying to keep this from excessively cooking. I need to get it a little bit further, and then I can get started on the chicken. I will get my measuring cup because I can't. I don't need the measuring cup. Well, not yet, at least. I'm not going to steal a piece of cauliflower and eat it. Mm. Cauliflower is one of my favorite vegetables. So, it's just sitting there looking so tempting. And honestly, with the amount of cauliflower I've got in here, I could probably half fill the container just with cauliflower. So. I am looking for a certain translucence in the onion, which is showing up now. If I hadn't cooked so much at once here, it would have cooked faster, but I would have been cooking repeatedly in order to get to the same point. Celery is also turning translucent. The onions are starting to, pardon me, the, the potatoes are starting to show that they're cooking. The zucchini is at this point about half cooked. And this is just really simple, just a little bit of butter for the flavor and a little bit of salt. You could add pepper. My husband doesn't like pepper, so I'm not. And Okay, Teen Bug, we know you're there. Everybody's got different things to do. I mean, it's a Saturday night, it's generally cooking time and eating time for people. So, and at this point, I'm going to add some of my mushrooms here. And this is uh, a whole pound of mushrooms. I'm not adding a whole pound. Uh, so I am just going to throw in about half of these. And I will be using some more of these with my chicken fried steak. put a light cook on these as well because they will also finish cooking in the oven. If you have anything that you'd like to see me cook or you've always wondered uh, how to cook it, uh, go ahead and uh, go on to my Discord. My husband will pop up my Discord address for everybody. And there is a section in there for stream suggestions. No, I'm not doing hedgehog stew, so stop that. 
You can find uh, one of the sections under there is stream suggestions, might say requests, not sure at this moment. And you can uh, put in your requests, like my request, the request that was put in there for the uh, chicken mushroom chowder, if you really want to know how to make, um, oh, I don't know. You want to know how to make shrimp bisque, or you've always wondered how to uh, make potato salad. I'll make potato salad eventually. And you can just put in these requests for things like that, and uh, I will try to oblige them as soon as possible. Uh, upcoming also as well, although my followers are uh, only at about 150 at this point. When I reach 200 followers, I am going to celebrate that by giving away a copy of my cookbook, Cooking with Hedge Picks. And at that point, I will also have figured out a price for it, and at that point, you can also buy it if you are not the lucky winner. So when that happens, will there be a big celebration and we will have that giveaway and you can have my recipes for everything, salads and vegetables, casseroles, meats, vegetarian dishes. The canning section is in there for those of you that are interested in doing canning and preservations of foods. So. And I'm going to also have to figure out whether, uh, how much it's going to cost to do a printed version of my cookbook in case you want to have a printed version, because I know there are some people that do. Uh, the first release will be in an ebook. It will be Kindle release or PDF so that you can uh, just read the PDF or print it if you want to. You can print out the page you want to use. And it's a combination of my family's recipes, my own recipes. It's, honestly, it's mostly mine. Um, it's at this point almost 400 recipes, and that's quite a fat little book at this point. Okay, I've got probably another minute or two here, so I am going to get the chicken out and start to do things with chicken. I will have to move aside my chicken. The steak that I'm going to make in the chicken fried steak, which as I said before, is cube steaks. So I will put them where they can't believe I'm making. And get out the chicken, which is still semi-frozen. That's fine. Take a little bit longer to cook it, but honestly, not by that much. Am I still sounding really funky, honey? Was not a good choice. And I'm going to transfer this to the scoop until I can pick it up because it's quite heavy. And I am putting this in the same very large Pyrex bowl that has the cauliflower in it. Maybe that I actually have enough to make two pot pies, in which case I will. I 
I believe I just heard it from my husband. England is kind of a pie nation. They do a lot of different kinds of pies. Um, we basically just occasionally do pot pies, but it's a major thing for them. It's, it's you know, steak and ale, and they have the regional pot pies that they do that are uh, like the Lancashire pasties, the Cornish pasties, and uh, then you have your steak and ale, steak and kidney pie, a lot of different kinds of pies. And they have them for lunches and dinners with mash and mushy peas and gravy. And I've had actually several different kinds of their pies. They're all scrumptious. They really are. Take that off the heat for now. And I have got the vegetables here, which I am going to give a mix to. Oh yeah, this is going to make two pies. <laughs> There's no way this is fitting in one. Because I have now almost completely filled that uh, very large bowl. See? <clears throat> and I'm just mixing these through together. All right. Now what I need to do is take these uh, pieces of chicken and I need to cut them into more manageable sizes. So I'm going to take and trim off some of the bits I can see that are fat and uh, bits that we don't want to have anything to do with and have tendon in them and some connective tissue that would make for an unpleasant bite. So we remove those ahead of time. And there's some fat as well. I don't really recommend cutting towards your hand, but I do it anyway. So, now this is a skinless, boneless uh, chicken thigh that we get from Costco. They have a nice size, they're a decent price. And I am just going to cut those into about a half inch slice. And then I am going to further reduce that by probably a three quarters slice. So it's slightly bigger in one direction than the other. And being careful to keep my fingers out of the way when I do this. <laughs> Apartment smells full of veg. Yeah, it'll st start smelling like meat too, sweetheart. You won't have to smell veg forever. You'll just have to eat it in your pie. And I'm assuming that the chicken will heal the vegetables and make them more acceptable. So, I have got these, and as you can see, they're in a reasonable size piece. That will make them cook a little faster and it will also make them more bite friendly. Oh, this, this is going to be a fairly rustic pie. Um, I've got a manly man for a husband and, you know, always good to make sure that you have nice big bites of meat and vegetables and not have dainty diced stuff that kind of all blends in together. I am going to take and cut off another piece of butter and put it in the pan here. And add a bit more oil. And that's about a tablespoon of oil to that, a tablespoon of butter. And I am going to start adding the 
chicken to this. So far I've only got one hand dirty the chicken, so I'm going to keep it that way. And this calls for four chicken breasts, or I've got four large chicken thighs. You can see that's a pretty big thigh there. It was from a beefy chicken. So I'm going to cut out the areas that usually have a bit of the connective tissue from the bone. And I'm going to reverse that because I, even I don't want to cut towards my hand with that. So I've got that bit out, and I've got a bit of fat lump here, which I don't want to put in there, so I'm going to cut that off, and cut away this big lump of fat here. Chicken thighs are really lovely fatty pieces of meat, lots of flavor, lots of fat, and if you're on a high fat diet, like the... Uh, keto diets are, it's definitely a choice for you. I know they do low-fat ketos too, but most people don't. Ooh, that's a bit more frozen than the other one was, probably because it was thicker. Um, you could use chicken breast if you want to use leaner meat. Um, like I said, personal preference, I like cooking with chicken thighs because they just are juicier and they have more flavor than a chicken breast does. Always making sure of where your fingers are in the edge of the blade. You don't ever want to be pressing down on something like this and have your fingers anywhere in danger you can cut yourself very badly and suddenly cooking preparations turn into emergency room visits and 911 calls. So let's just not do that and let's be a little safe with the cutting. Uh, if you were to take all of the chicken fat off of things and render it down you could create what Hey daddy how's it going? Nice to see you here. I think he's talking to you. I think she's talking to you. <laughs> Hi, badass mama. How's it? How's your husband doing? Is he is he getting better? Um, I'm doing better. So I'm. I I heard that your husband. I saw where you said in my Discord that your husband was really sick right now. Um, I surely hope and have continued to hope that he's getting better and things are getting better for your family. Oh no, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, well, you will be in my prayers and continue to hope that he gets better from this soon. It's just really hard to have your family members, especially your husband, in the hospital. And my heart goes out to you. I've had more than a few little doctor runs in the hospital with my husband, although I far outnumber him in that. But uh, I know it's tough. And uh, if you need to talk, just let me know. I'll be happy to listen. You are joining us to see me making the cauliflower cheese chicken pot pie, which is a combination of the British dish, cauliflower cheese. Um, as far as making it vegan for you, I would think you would have to use uh, almond milk for making the cheese sauce and use vegan cheese. I'm not really sure how that works, if it melts particularly well or not, but you could also just make it with a uh, standard chicken gravy instead. And as far as that goes, again, using the gluten-free flours, because I know that you're gluten-free as well, if I recall right. So I'm just cutting up some chicken thigh here. While this is in the oven and baking, I will be making chicken fried steak uh, with some pan gravy afterwards. 
Ooh, that's a big chunk of thigh there too. All right, there's the part I want to cut away, which is where it came close to the bone when they were deboning it. It's got a little bit of cartilage left there sometimes, and I want to make sure it's not in when I'm cooking. So, this one looks to be fairly good fat-wise. There's a little bit of a fat strip running across the top here. Which I'm going to cut away. I am taking a shortcut in this as well in that I am using Pillsbury Pie Crust because I just don't have the oomph to do all of this and make pie, pie, pie crust from scratch. I do have a very good recipe for it. Um, yeah, it is a little bit easier to cut these and have them be the right size if it's semi-frozen. And because I'm cutting through it, I think you can see that it's semi-frozen because if it was solidly frozen, I would just be chipping it. Um, it's actually a lot easier to cut a lot of kinds of meat if they are partially frozen. So it helps them keep their shape, it helps you handle them without a lot of uh, stress and fussing. So that is something that is kind of a nice benefit. Uh, it's also a benefit if you're needing to cut something like cheese to partially freeze that. Um, I would ask you to give Badass Mama a shout out, but she does not stream here on Twitch. She streams on YouTube. But if you'd like to see some of her recipes, which are vegan and gluten-free, and uh, obviously dairy-free, you do the vegan, you can find her there on uh, YouTube. And I have watched some of her streams. And she's got some very interesting recipes, and she makes them very approachable. So that is definitely a benefit. I don't know if I need more meat than that. Oh, well, it's out. I might as well use it. And once again, like I always do, I make sure when I am looking at the food that I am making for my family or myself, that I cut out anything that's unappetizing and anything I don't want to take a bite of or have them take a bite of. So it uh, just does an inspection on the quality of the meat and the vegetables. And it's just something that helps you stay healthy. Don't eat bad food. Um, I know that in these days we don't want to waste anything, but it is better to not eat vegetables that are turning, meat that's gone off its date, and it's starting to be a little iffy. On a, if, it, if you're not going to use it immediately or within a day or two, throw it in the freezer and that will help preserve uh, the quality and health, healthfulness, I guess I should say, to your meats. And can't do that with your produce, so you just try to buy those within a couple days of when you're going to use them. Even the same day would be better, but it's not always possible. So, alright, I am going to put the chicken shreds back into the dish that came from. And then I am going to put this out of the way so I don't confuse it with anything. And let me see what I can do. Wipe off the top of my board so there's no chicken juices. And those little tiny bits of chicken rubble. And I'm going to set this board aside because once you use a board with chicken, you do not use it again until you have washed that puppy in salt. Uh, pardon me, soapy water, not salty water. So you want to make sure you do that. And I am going to wash my hands very thoroughly here with an antibacterial hand wash, which will 
kill all the little bugaboos. I'm starting to get quite the collection of... Uh, I'm starting to get quite the collection of cutting boards here. I have bought a set of them out of bamboo that's very nice from uh, Walmart. Okay, move this out of the way again. And I will bring forward my other cutting board, which is where presently the container. I kind of need that out of the way because I need to cook this. Alright, so I'm turning this here back on to sort of a medium to medium high heat and I will be seasoning this properly. So I am going to put on some salt and I've got this is sea salt in a grinder and I just add a little bit because we've all been working on reducing our sodium and this will also have rosemary in it and I've got that in a grinder as well because I don't particularly enjoy having rosemary stems in my cooking. So this gets ground up fine like pepper. So you have all of the benefits of the rosemary flavor without having all of the drawbacks of having little sticks in your food. Because rosemary is basically an herb that um, looks a lot like pine needles and it has kind of a piney taste to it as well. I am going to be adding some rubbed sage leaves to this and I am using a half a teaspoon of sage and that was approximately a quarter teaspoon of rosemary and then I will add a tablespoon of parsley. So I'll measure that into my palm. And a tablespoon is roughly a palm in my hand. I practiced as a teenager finding out how, how big spices were if I poured them into my hand because my grandmother always measured things into her hand and she'd always say that's about a teaspoon, that's about a half a teaspoon. I always asked how do you know and she said well because that's just what it looks like. Oh absolutely fresh rosemary is wonderful. My cousin Tara uh, used to have it all around her house. I know, my teenage years were really wild. <laughs> there was none of this rebellion for me. No, no, I rebelled in the kitchen. So, learning to cook and season while other kids were learning to drink and take drugs. Probably helps that I come from a very cons conservative family. And my father was in law enforcement, so that helps it even be more conservative. Um, so I, I grew up, uh, a good time was playing cards with my family. We'd all get together and have pinochle competitions. And we'd play cutthroat pinochle. It was absolutely a brutal partner game and bragging rights were huge. <laughs> now unlike the vegetables, which we were looking for a half cook on, with chicken, when it's used in a casserole like this or a pie, you want it to be completely cooked. As I mentioned before, you can now get pre-cooked uh, chicken that's already diced, you know, a couple pounds of it from the freezer section. You can find uh, rotisserie chicken bits at Costco and often in the stores. You just get a rotisserie chicken and take the meat off. It's already pre-seasoned, um, which except for the garlic uh, is this. I don't cook with garlic because I'm allergic, but if you like garlic, go ahead and add um, maybe a cube to the, uh, um, 
a garlic clove to it. You can uh, either slice it or you could put it through one of the garlic presses, which turns it into a nice little mush. You could add a teaspoon of garlic puree, which you can get, or diced garlic, which you can get in almost all of your um, uh, produce sections now in the grocery. Pink pig! And out from the bushes comes Pink Pig! Yay! Pink Pig! Pink Pig! It's Pink Pig! Pink Pig really loves this recipe. The cauliflower cheese is her favorite. So, yay! Pink Pig! I know that several people have mentioned that Pink Pig is their favorite off of this stream. I will try not to be jealous that Pink Pig is liked more than me. <laughs> Broccoli and cheese is wonderful. This cauliflower cheese recipe comes from my husband's mother in England. and. Cauliflower cheese is a baked dish from them. <laughs> yes, Pink Pig is much less hassle. Um, cauliflower cheese is a cauliflower that is poached or steamed and in the florets put into a casserole dish. They make a cheese sauce with cheddar cheese only, a nice good medium or sharp, and uh, that has a little bit of dry mustard in it as well. So it adds a nice savoriness to it and goes along with the tang. And then they pour that over the cauliflower and mix it through until the cheese sauce to cauliflower is about the same as you would get in a um, macaroni and cheese here and then it is thrown into the oven on high temperature to get the top all browned and bubbly. And that is served as a, as a uh, side dish all across the UK and is actually much beloved. And I can see why she cooked it for me and my husband when they came out to visit and I had to have the recipe because it was fabulous. So, I mean, it goes, I don't know why, it just goes beyond the cauliflower with cheese sauce poured over it. It's just, it's so much better. All right, so we are continuing to brown this chicken. And spices here, this has got salt, it has got a quarter teaspoon of rosemary, a half teaspoon of rubbed sage, it's got a tablespoon of parsley, it has a little bit of salt, probably a quarter of a teaspoon at most, uh, a little bit less than that actually because I'm a little bit conservative. And cheese contains a lot of sodium so if you're cooking something that has cheese in it you want to be a little conservative with the cheese or with the salt and uh, taste it before you put any further uh, sodium in it so make sure you've got it combined with the cheese sauce or cheese and then taste it before you add salt or you can very easily end up with a salt bomb that nobody really likes the flavor of because there's one thing you can't do is take the salt out. So that's always good to be conservative. Your husband is calling you? I assume your husband is calling you. Um, I've never met your husband, so that would be a pretty strange thing to do. Anyway, this is coming along nicely. It'll probably be another five minutes on this chicken to get it cooked through. And then I will combine that into the vegetables and we will make the cheddar sauce that's going to go on it. And then tuck it into one or two of these eight by eight baking dishes and top them with 
the pastry crust and then they get popped into the oven for 30 minutes so that the pastry gets all nice and brown and everything is all heated through and it gets all nice and bubbly. And then while that is cooking, we'll go on to the second half of the stream and I will make chicken fried steak. That is cube steak that is breaded and fried and then you use the pan drippings from that to make a milk gravy that you pour across it. And that's yummy and tasty. Uh, it is a very homey Midwest stick to your ribs farm type cooking which is what my grandmother did exclusively. Uh, she grew up in a railroad town because her father and brothers uh, worked on the railroad across the country and they put in the railroad here in Washington State and uh, they traveled with it and wherever they went they put up little railroad towns which now are gone and one of my every time we drove by where they used to have their town it was a place called Gibbon Washington and it doesn't really exist anymore. Now there is just a Gibbon Road and all of the temporary structures are gone and that was where she grew up. Um, she would play with all of the kids that were attached to the railroad families. She had great stories about how they would play. One of the things they had in the area was sagebrush or tumbleweeds when they get dry and break off from the ground. And what the kids used to do is they would go find the biggest sagebrush that they could find. And these things get enormous. Excuse me. <coughs> I need to drink some more. These tumbleweed would get enormous. They could be easily three feet across or more. And what they would do is they would saw them off the size they wanted them, and they would hang them and let them dry for a couple months during the summer. Now this was an area that not only was very arid, it was basically prairie. Had sagebrush, had scrub brush, had you know, a little bit of scrub grass growing. And this was very close to pure desert area. They had some very tall hills. And what the kids would do is they would let the sagebrush dry until they became tumbleweeds. And this area would easily have several times a year winds 50 to 80 miles an hour. And what the kids would do is they would take these sagebrush, which are now giant tumbleweeds, and they would tie a rope around the um, trunk or stem of these tumbleweeds, and they would tie the other end around their waist, and they would go up on the top of the hill that was nearby, and they would basically leap off the edge of the of the hill when it was under these high winds and the winds would catch the tumbleweeds and they would basically be dragged along behind the tumbleweed uh, kind of like they were parasailing <laughs> except they had their feet on dry land and were running pell-mell down a hill. I'm sure there was lots of uh, crash and burns but my, my grandmother always told me they were fun. Uh, because at the age they were doing this, they were small enough that the tumbleweeds would drag them. So, <laughs> anyway, she was taught by her mother to cook, and they cooked the farm-style food because they had men that worked hard all day long, physical work, uh, you know, putting in the railroads, lifting in these huge girders, setting the 
setting the rails and it was just nothing but hard unending labor for them and uh, they needed a lot of calories and the pictures of my grandfather great grandfather pardon me and his sons all of them just whipcord thin but uh, they ate well and were fed those lovely meals of mashed potatoes with fried chicken and milk gravy and chicken fried steak and you know pot roasts and you know they didn't have they didn't have salad for dinner or if they had soup it was a stew and had lots of other things with it you know vegetables and breads and I focused on the main dishes and my cousin focused on the bread and the pies and the cakes. So she did the bakery thing. She's the pastry chef of the two of us. And I do the hearty main meals. So together we make a great team when we were cooking all the way from when I was 10 until I was 18. Every summer I'd come over to the farm and uh, Grandma would teach me some more about cooking and Tara would learn some more about cooking and we'd do the cooking part of the time and end up having her making the dessert breads and cakes and pies and rolls for dinner and such and I just focused on making the chicken fried steak and the fried chicken and all of the other dishes that my grandmother taught. And she's the one that gave me my base education on cooking, which I then spent the next 44 years learning to improve upon, learning from PBS and celebrity uh, chefs. Well, thank you, Tina Bug. That's, that's part of why I wrote my uh, cookbook the way I did. My cookbook started out as a family cookbook. This is almost done. Uh, it started out as a family cookbook where I was just going to make sure we had a, a great aunt who did all of the holiday cooking. Everybody came to her house for Thanksgiving and Christmas and you know Fourth of July. All of the big holidays were always at her house and she spent days cooking and every dish that was your favorite she made sure was there for you and she'd have 18 or 20 people that were guests at her house and she'd cook she didn't just cook a pie she cooked five pies and she'd have an apple pie and a cherry pie and she'd have a pumpkin pie and she'd usually do mincemeat and then she'd do another pie and it was all because different people like different pies she wanted to make sure you got what you loved and so she made those for us because she loved us and that was just always where we went and all of my best childhood memories involving family get-togethers and such involved her and her recipes and she never shared any of them she she said they were going to her daughter and when she died unexpectedly they were just gone. Her daughter didn't know where they were, if they were written down. Um, my Uncle John didn't know if she had something. I'm sure they got thrown away if she had them written anywhere. But my cousin never got any. My cousin, who was her daughter, so my father's cousin actually, she never got any of the recipes. And those recipes are just gone now. And that's just that's just a crime because so much of your memories of your family and get-togethers and your extended relatives have to do around things like cooking and meals and just having your grandmother's recipe for fried chicken where you cook her chicken and the smells are there and the tastes are there and it brings it all back and for a little while, you know, those people are fresh in your memory again, and you remember all the stories about how you used to jump off the, the rockery that separated Aunt Nebs's 
uh, garden that she had, or you remember the stories that your grandmother told you about, you know, playing with tumbleweeds, and you just remember all these stories, and it all comes back with a smell and a taste, with food, basically, and it's just such a wonderful way to preserve those memories. Well, I tracked down as many recipes from the family as I could. I've tried to recreate some of Aunt Mebs's recipes, and I've managed to create some, recreate some of them. Um, some of them were very, very old recipes that I found in cookbooks that were from the turn of the century. Uh, some of them were from the 1800s even. And it's astounding what you find when you actually look into these things. Um, anyway, it's just incredible. And I started putting them together into a cookbook because I didn't want to lose the recipes I got from my brothers. I didn't want to have someone lose my recipes because my plan was never to have kids. And I have not had children, so I can't pass these on to my children myself, but I can pass them on to my nieces and nephews and my brothers and, you know, extended family out there that, that may want copies of it. And I wanted to also, because food connects with memories, I wanted to make the memories live forever too. So, when I started writing the cookbook, I didn't just write down the recipes and instructions for cooking it. I also wrote stories that went with those recipes. I have a story in there for... Honey, can you take this pan and uh, rinse it out for me? Um, I had stories about, for instance, the... Um, oyster stuffing that my sister-in-law's father made and I never that was never a recipe for our family but it was something that he made every year for Christmas and for their for their bird because he liked oyster stuffing and my first Christmas alone away from my family. I wasn't really alone. I was away from my immediate family, from my parents. And I was in my early 20s. And I was actually living in my oldest brother's basement. But the plan had been I was going to go home for Christmas. And he was all the way across the state from home. It was a good five hour drive. And my work schedule suddenly said I had to work the day after Christmas. So I couldn't go home. And I was so upset about that. I was just crushed. And I was feeling really sad. And my sister-in-law had her family there. All of her sisters came in from different states. Thank you, sweetheart. They all came in from different states. And they were there for the Christmas. And she had her nieces and nephews there. And all three of her sisters and their husbands and her parents and one of my grandmothers was there, my mother's grandmother. They all lived in eastern Washington. And they were there, but I didn't have my mom and dad there. And I was just feeling so sad and so alone. And Anna's father, that's my oldest sister-in-law, Anna's father had daughters, just daughters. So he was kind of sensitive to uh, daughters, girls. And he noticed that I was kind of sitting off by myself and I was sad. And so he started asking me about, you know, what did my family do for Thanksgiving and Christmas? Uh, what, what recipes did we use? What kind of stuffing? And he asked me if I liked oysters, and I said I did. And he says, have you ever had oyster stuffing? And I, I hadn't. And he said, well, I've made some. And he was a military base commander, so it was kind of rare that he cooked. So these were his big contributions to his family. And 
he made oyster stuffing and he made Waldorf salad. And he drew me out and talked to me about all my memories of my family and paid attention to me. And I will always remember him for his kindness to me, who he didn't really even know. Um, and now whenever I have oyster stuffing or I have Waldorf salad, I remember Roger and he's gone now, but every time I have it, it brings me back to the kindness that this man showed. To a very lonely young girl. Her first time away from home. I'm not crying on stream, honey. I'm just overcome with emotion. Anyway, so that is what I kind of wanted to share because I don't want to have that memory lost. And after she lost her father, I shared that story and that recipe with my sister-in-law and she was very touched. She didn't know that her father had done that and it kind of brought him back to her after he was gone. And that's the power of recipes and food. That's what they do. And I didn't want to lose that. I didn't want to lose those special memories that you know, maybe nobody else knew. So you have my recipes in there and you have the recipes from in-laws and extended family. And you also have the stories that kind of immortalize them. So, they're not your family stories, but hopefully when you cook my recipes and you share them with other people, they kind of become your stories and you add to them in your own mind. So that's my hope for my recipe books and part of why I got into doing cooking streaming so that these recipes don't die and neither do the stories. And I hope people indulge me with the fact that um, I'm sharing them. So, <laughs> now what you're looking for, I am beginning to build the cheese sauce here. And that starts with, in this case, a little bit over half a stick of butter and about three quarters cup of flour. And I'm going to add a little bit of oil to this because it needs to be a little bit looser than this. So I'm going to add about half a teaspoon of oil or a teaspoon to a teaspoon. So that'll loosen it up because the texture you're looking for to make your roux is less big clumps and more like um, wet sand. And you want to let that cook and this is over a medium to medium high heat. Nothing is really ever done at a high heat in my cooking, unless you're talking about frying, and then that's obviously higher heat. Uh, see, this is more like a paste or kind of like a sand. You want to cook this for about three to five minutes so that your flour is cooked and won't have that raw taste. And then when we add the milk to it, it'll just thicken and be... Uh, lovely and creamy and tasty and I'm using 2% milk you can use 4% if that's what you'd like I probably wouldn't do it with anything less because you do need the fat and this milk is going to be pretty much taken up by everything that I'm doing this is a I believe it's two quarts to half gallon 1.89 liters so yeah it's roughly two quarts and this is going to be mostly taken up by this cheese sauce and then the pan gravy that I'm going to make, which is a milk-based gravy for the chicken fried steak. And as I said, these recipes are not yet up. 
Excuse me. <coughs> Still getting ambushed occasionally. I think I'm done coughing. As you can see, my lung affliction is still a little bit with me. Okay. I know I have my phone here with me for photo purposes. I am going to get that out so I can use it. while that roux is cooking. <coughs> Sorry. So, all right, this is now starting. It turns a little bit white around the edges and it kind of lightens in color. And I will soon be stirring milk into it. And this is going to use three cups of milk. I've got a lot of fill in here. Actually, I might increase that to four, but we'll see. I'll do three and a half to start. Now take a brief moment while I use an inhaler. Excuse me, please. That's pretty much cooked itself much drier. And what I'm going to do now is add three cups of room temperature milk. You want to have warmer milk because cold milk, when it hits the hot pan and hot uh, flour and butter, will seize up. And it will make lumps. We don't want lumps. We want a nice, smooth, bechamel or white sauce. It's one of the seven mother sauces that they have, which is basically sauces that are created and all of the other sauces in the world are made from it. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm still not completely over my bronchitis that I had, so uh, cooking uh, Talking while I'm cooking um, is sometimes a bit of a strain on my poor abused little lungs. So I am then going to, you guys have seen me make a white sauce so many times. <coughs> Can we mute this for a second, honey? I 
I do need something hot, I'm sorry. This is just being cooked over a medium to medium high heat. It is combined now with the flour and it will thicken the milk into this white sauce. I apologize for the coughing in my voice. Uh, my husband's going to make me some tea, so that will hopefully relax my chest too. Uh, so this is three and a half cups of milk in with probably two thirds of a stick of butter. So it's about seven, no, six uh, tablespoons of butter. And it will, uh, then it's three quarters of a cup of flour and a little bit of oil because I needed a little bit more oil this time. It's, it kind of varies. You need to pay attention to the texture of things. Uh, sometimes that three quarters cup of flour and three quarters of a stick of butter will be very soft and melty and sometimes the flour just sort of absorbs the liquid and you need to uh, you need to make it so that you thin it with some uh, oil to get it to the right consistency first. Pig pig! Yay! It's a pig pig! Can you reach that double photo frame for me, dear honey? Yes. Will you? No. I thought you might enjoy seeing some of the people that I'm immortalizing in this. And this, turn it the right way, are pictures of my father's parents. Uh, the picture on the side here, that is my grandfather in his official photo when he was the mayor in a town. And this is actually the wedding picture of my grandparents. And this was, she was just 18 years old, and he was considerably older than her. They met on the railroads, and they were married and together nonstop. They never went anywhere apart for over 50 years. And that is my paternal grandparents, Alice and Van. So, <clears throat> I have got my sauce here and it is to the right consistency. I will probably add a little bit more milk because it's also going to thicken while I'm putting in cheese. But this requires two cups of, this is medium cheddar. So I'm gonna put it in by the handful. And as you add the cheese, you don't wanna add it all at once. You do wanna sprinkle it across because the idea is that this, melts. Put that down there. Thank you. Did you put milk in it? No, put milk right next. Okay. Then you want to mix it in because you want it to melt and uh, make a lovely smooth cheese sauce. I do not have the dry mustard. I thought we did. We don't. We didn't have time to go to the store, so I am unfortunately just going to skip it. So this won't be exactly my mother-in-law's. No, you don't. This will not be exactly my mother-in-law's cheese sauce, but it will be close. So I have got very close to two cups in here now, and that is enough for two cups. I'm going to add a little bit of extra milk to that because it is thickening up a lot. So I'm adding about a cup extra of milk. If that gives me extra cheese sauce, oh no. And I'm adding milk to my tea because that's how I like it. And I just threw cheese into the milk. Won't that be fun? Uh, okay. Got this, and now I am stirring it to incorporate and make sure everything is melted and smooth. <clears throat> and then I will taste it for seasoning once it's all combined.
and we are almost there and I am going to have to thin it again a little bit more milk that was probably another half cup so Okay. I don't see now if this has enough of a cheesy consistency. And I will be silly and do it with a measuring cup. So I have got the cheese sauce here and I'm basically finished. I am going to take it now, turn the heat off, and I will take the vegetables that I have cooked previously and mix together here. They're in a big Pyrex bowl. And I will take and ladle the cheese sauce in on top of it. start mixing this together so it's actually combined the cheese sauce and the meat and the vegetables so everything is nice and coated and that's nowhere near enough so I'll still be adding in here uh, I've got a parent out here so I am going to leave you for a moment and we will be right back Okay, I am back and uh, I have combined the cheese sauce profoundly with the uh, vegetables and meat and now I am getting out the first of the two of my 8 by 8 baking dishes that I'm going to use and I will be ladling filling in here and then I'm going to put a pastry crust over the top so I 
possibly at this point could have filled an 18 by uh, 9 baking dish. I've got so much filling here that it's going to be delicious and I will be making two pies because of this. And these are more or less a very deep pot pie or a pastry top casserole if you want to think of it that way. Filled with lots of vegetables and seasoned chicken. It's in a uh, cauliflower cheese sauce made with medium cheddar cheese. And it is going to be creamy and delectable. I am not going to overfill this. <laughs> Probably will a little bit, but okay. And then I'm going to take a little bit of the cheddar cheese here. And I'm going to put a light layer just across the top just to add a little bit of extra cheesiness to it. And then I have these pre-made Pillsbury crusts from the grocery store. And they come in rounds, which should be okay as far as this is concerned. If it's not completely filled, uh, covered, that's fine, but it should be because these are pretty big pie crusts. Yeah. They come already rolled up for you and ready to go in a typical pie thickness. And get it to slide out. It kind of wants to stay. Uh, so they come like this and you want to carefully open it up, peel back the edges, and what you have is a nice pastry round which is then laid gently over the top of your dish and you want to Push it in here so it's all to the inside. And then I am going to take and lightly clamp it to the sides of the container here. And then roll this over and you seal that down to itself I need to have a sip of tea excuse me while I do that these pies actually do freeze uh, well, you can take and freeze them at this point, and then uh, you can get them out and thaw them, or throw them into the oven, 375, like I said, and you will want to make sure that you cook them for much longer. If it's frozen, it'll be something like uh, an hour and a half. You will definitely want to wrap the sides for that so that they, the crust doesn't burn. You put uh, tin foil over, the, over just the edges. And yeah, they would freeze beautifully and you can take them out for later baking. Or you could cook it first and then freeze it and <laughs> still take it out to have it uh, just have a much lighter time in the oven. I'm going to add a small crimp onto this to make it look a little more festive. And that's done by just putting one finger here. I don't know if you can see it. Put one finger on the edge, take the other thumb and push it forward till it makes this little C shape and then you move it forward so you just keep doing it all the way around the pie crust. And it just makes it a little pretty. Don't worry if it's not perfect. It is just to be eaten after all. And 
then when I get done crimping the pie, you can add cutouts of different shapes on top to make it pretty. You can use an egg wash if you like. I've never really seen the purpose of an egg wash. What it would do is make the top, when it's browned, it would be kind of glossy and uh, be a different quality of brown to it, but that's fine. Uh, you can do it if you'd like. You don't have to. An egg wash is just one egg mixed with about a teaspoon of water that you then whip up and brush lightly over the surface of your pastry. So now as you see I have a lovely fluted edge on this and I am going to take the knife and I'm going to put a couple slits in it so that the filling and the steam have a place to go. And that's so you don't blow the top off your pie, basically. Um, so I've got this in here, and then I'm going to add a nice little cut to the top. And we will set this one aside somewhere. Um, I will move some of these things on my side table off. And as you can see, I've got little slits cut in the crust and it's kind of smiling at you. And I will now move the second pan. I don't have a matching one, but it's an 8x8 eight eight, uh, non-stick um, cake pan, basically. And I'm going to bring that over here and put as much of the filling as I can into it. Possibly not the best plan in the world. I'm going to put as much as I can into it, but it sure makes for a nice pie. And, you know, feel free to use like a 10 inch pie plate for this if you'd like. Um, I just like the idea of using the square ones. So I didn't have to dig out mom's uh, pie pans as well. So that's just one more thing for Andrew to do. So. And yep, this recipe makes two 8x8 eight eight pies. Just so you know, I will update the quantity on that so that everybody knows how much they're making. And if they want to make only one, they'll have to half the recipe. Um, you want to make sure, Tina, if you're going to be freezing this, that you use containers that are okay for the freezer. You can use the disposable um, aluminum ones, and that's fine. Um, then just make sure that you wrap it well in um, aluminum foil. Or you get containers like the Pyrex, which are good from uh, freezer to oven and microwave. So those are another way to go. All right, now I am going to get out where to go. It's over here. Each one of these pie containers from Pillsbury come with two pies. There's giving you the option, of course, for two, uh, either two single crust pies, where you have the pie crust on the bottom, a top crust for like a pot pie, or you can have a double crust, which you generally find in fruit pies and you want to make sure if you're going to freeze these let them cool completely before you put them in the freezer or you're going to end up with kind of a watery icy mess on the inside. I need to put the extra cheese in this as well. So I'll put that little roll down for a second. <coughs> and scatter it over the top again. So what you're going to have is a nice melty layer of cheese inside this just underneath the crust. That should be really yummy. 
And I'm not really quantifying that. That's somewhere between a third and a half a cup of cold cheese, probably. And then I will take the edge of this. Again, you can see it is just kind of stuck together there. And I will unroll it. And fit it over the top of my container as evenly as I can and then tuck it in so that basically it's in contact with the surface of the pie, the filling, and then I will start pushing it down gently against the edges so that it stays in place and then I will fold it under again like I did before and press that down. And as you go around the corners, you'll have to give it a little bit of an extra mush because you've got more of a crust to put around the corners and crusts don't fold easily. So, I'll put this in here. Now, if this had been in a round pie container, it would have been a lot neater of a pie crest edge and I wouldn't be probably folding anything. I would just be crimping what's there. But again, that doesn't really matter. The edge of this pie is not what people are going to be talking about. They're going to be talking about the yummy filling and how good it was. And I know people like pie crust and that's why it's there. You have the option, of course, of making this a double crust and I am once again going to crimp the edges just so it makes a nice little little shape. It's just a visual thing really. It doesn't do anything except maybe also make sure that the edges of the pie are a little better crimped together than if you didn't. Um, but it looks nice so why not? around until I get back to my original space. And you don't have to worry if it's not exactly even, if some of your little waves you make are bigger than others. It's just a little decorative bit of frou-frou. So there again we have a crimped edge. And I am once more going to go in here and cut some slits. Don't have to be a lot, you just have to make sure it goes through the pie crust to the filling or it won't vent properly. And then I'm making another little happy face in the middle. And these are now ready for my husband to take them away on a baking dish. And you want to make sure this isn't pretty, but it's because it's not nonstick. And it's basically a grooved Pie uh, it's like a jelly roll pan, really. I don't think I'm going to get two of these on it, so it's a good thing he brought me two of them. Here's the first one. How long? Uh, 30 minutes. Set the timer for 25 and we'll look at it then. And then here's the second one. put it in the oven too or you can just do it afterwards. So that's in a preheated 375 degree oven. I think if you were going to cook this from frozen, I would recommend the same temperature but instead of only being 30 minutes, you're looking at about an hour and a half. So I am going to put these things to the side now. And I'll need the ladle back, but other than that, no. And 
I am now done with the Dutch oven. Or, pardon me. Sorry. A little addled here. I am done with the hot plate. So I am going to move my Neo clean on cutting board here. And I am going to not going to be using cheese in the pan gravy, which is made with milk. I will eventually be using the mushrooms in it. But at this point, I want to bring up Pink Pink the fact that she took a run for the floor. Thank you. Got this back. And what I've got out now is my big frying pan. And Pink Pig has rejoined us. Yay, Pink Pig! So, uh, I will move this forward to where you can see it once I make sure that I'm not going to be needing any of the cutting board uses. I don't think I will. Okay, so I'm going to get this out of the way. Yeah. This and that. And basically, now what I need to do this is going to be a breading system here. And what you need to do is take a pan and put some seasoned flour in it. flour and I am going to mix the panko bread with it eventually uh, but to start I'm going to take some flour about a cup and I am going to use half of this just for flour because I may be needing to add some more flour to it, who's to say. And then I have Kikoman Peiko Japanese style breadcrumbs, which means what you've actually got here is breadcrumbs are usually pretty fine. Panko breadcrumbs have a bigger texture to them. They're kind of uh, two to three times the size of your normal ones. They kind of look like um, dehydrated potato, honestly, but um, I'm going to put these here. I like them because they're extra crunchy. So I've got that there. And to that, to the regular breadcrumbs, you want to season your breadcrumbs because it needs to be seasoned. It won't taste like anything if you don't. So I'm going to put some salt in there. And I'm going to add a little bit of pepper. Not a lot. to it. And this is when you're doing breading, the first thing you're going to put it in is the plain flour or the flour versus the, you take it dry, put the flour on it, and then you put it into an egg wash. And then it goes from that into either a second coating of these breaded uh, And we are going to Okay, so I've got those two pre-done here. 
and then take a little bit of water to thin the egg with. So for two eggs, I would probably put two teaspoons or maybe just one teaspoon of water in it because you just want to loosen up the egg a little bit. And I am going to use a wire whisk here, pardon me, a plastic whisk, and whisk the eggs together with the water until they're nice and smooth. And what that will do is hold the breading to the meat. Now, normally my directions would say salt and pepper the meat on each side before you do this. I'm going to add a third egg in here because uh, I've got six of these steaks to make. And once again, it's, it's, it's all kind of optional, this two eggs, three eggs, it's what you think looks right. You can always add another egg to it. Um, worst thing is you waste a little bit of egg, not a big deal. So I have now whipped up egg here, and I am going to unplug all um, First, the hot plate, basically. So I put the hot plate. And plug in the electric skillet, which is big and square. I have got my little breading station here. That is the egg wash. That is the second step. Normally I have it lined up so that each had their own little container, but we are a little short on containers at the moment. I've been doing a lot of cooking and uh, it's a lot of things like soup and they tend to be taken up by this. So, I will take and move this out of the way. We don't need these right now. And I will find them. And move this over so it's in the right positions here. And I need to turn the frying pan on. I will start by pouring in some oil and once again when I get the breading all done I will let you all see this so that you can see the thing cooking and you don't want to fill this up like you're deep frying you just want to make sure you have maybe an eighth of an inch of oil across the bottom and since this is a very large pan that's probably a cup of oil um, this is a very large uh, electric skillet. It is about the size of a full-size lasagna pan. So I am now, I have one of these that actually has a temperature gauge and I am going to turn it up to 350 because you want to make sure this oil is hot. If your oil isn't hot, what you're going to get is a very nasty greasy mess where the flour absorbs the oil rather than the oil cooking the flour. So I am going to give that a minute or two while it heats up and I will start getting the steaks out and showing you what they look like. So these are cube steaks and that means that they have been put through a machine that cuts little slits in both sides of it and it cuts through the tough 
uh, fibers of the meat. Can you see that? It almost looks like ground beef, but it's not. It's still a steak. And um, that's what they call cubing a steak. And that makes it so it's nice and tender. And it's the one that's generally used for making chicken fried steak. You can do dip, deep frying on it if you have a deep fryer. I suppose it could be cooked in an air fryer. I haven't ever done anything like that yet, so I'll possibly give that a try at some point in the future. Meanwhile, I am just going to take these cube steaks, pile them on top of each other so when I want to bread them, I can do it in a nice long line. I have limited desk space here for this, so I will continue to stack these off, and once the oil is hot, and it shouldn't take long for it to heat up, I am going to put it into the hot oil right after breading it. So you want to do these things fresh, basically. It's, it's the best way to handle it. Now these cube steaks will freeze well as well for leftovers. Um, I would not put the gravy over them. I would put that kind of secondary, but I can feel this is heating up. The oil is already pretty, pretty warm. So I am going to take this and the first thing you do is take this meat and you're going to put it into the flour and the flour will cling to it as you can see. Then it goes into the egg wash. Just dip it and do both sides. And then it goes from the egg wash into the panko. And the panko then will cling to both sides. And it'll be a nice crunchy, but not really thick coating. And then into the fryer it goes. So again, flour. that it's got flour all over it. Shake off a little bit of the excess. Put it into the egg wash and don't mix up your hands. Use the one hand for doing the wet work and you will then put this breading back over it. And any of the flour or breading that you have in here, any of the breadcrumbs, you don't want to use them again. Throw it away. They're contaminated at this point with raw uh, meat. So we don't want to do that. And I will drop this in here, pour more of the flour. I left out a step. Sorry. I'm kind of half listening to what's going on in the background, so Sorry if that distracted me a bit. And you probably want to, you want to cook these well done. So you're probably looking at four or five minutes aside with your oil at 350. So I am just going to keep going. Flour it. Now it goes into the egg wash, and then from that into the panko. And then from the panko, it goes into the skillet. It's a bit of a messy job. Your hands are going to get a little goofy if that really bothers you. Buy yourself some nitrile uh, gloves, uh, basically surgeon type gloves, and uh, use that instead. And then when you're done, you can just peel them off and your your hands are not so uh, grubbed up. So I'm on my last steak here now. I will get that 
there. And we'll do what's left of the egg wash, which is not a lot. I probably could have gone with just two um, eggs, but I wanted to make sure I didn't run out. And now it goes into these breading here. And you want to make sure you do this rather rapidly because you do want all of them to be cooked at the same time. And I'm sorry if there's a lot of spatter sound uh, from the frying. It is pretty loud even on through my headset. So. All right, now I've got the last one in. And as you can see, my hands are kind of goopy here. So I am going to clean that off my hands and then give them another wash and get rid of the things that are in the way so that you can actually see the food while it's cooking. All right, so. And it's always, always, always the best thing to do to take and uh, wash your hands with soap and water or a uh, bacterial um, wash like I'm doing here. And make sure that you've got all of that raw meat uh, off of it so that you do not end up with food poisoning. Uh, with beef, that would most likely be uh, E. coli. So, I'm going to give my hands a good wash down. And, uh, my parents are actually going to be having chicken fried steak for dinner while my husband has his favorite part, the pie, which he claimed for, for England. By virtue of the fact that it's his mother's cauliflower cheese recipe that I absorbed into this. I'm going to wash my hands a second time. Make sure it's all off. Going between my fingers and around my fingernails and all of that. And all right, so I'm taking this out of the way. My second pan. And I'm putting that out of the way, and I've been moving in the frying pan so you can see what I was talking about. And like I said, this is going to make uh, this is going to make a lovely pan gravy afterwards um, once I get some excess oil out of it. But meanwhile, it just has to sit here and do its little frying thing. Uh, that is four to five minutes per side. So these have been in here for possibly two or three. The smaller ones were in here first. The larger ones were in here next last, unfortunately. So I will be starting from uh, two minutes on these and then flip them. Because we're going for cook well through, uh, cube steak is really not a steak you want to have medium or medium rare. Uh, if you choose to do so, that's certainly up to you. You won't get sick from it, but it's not really the classic way of serving it. This is a, uh, a steak that is served well done. I am going to drink a little bit more so my voice doesn't get out of me. back here. And for those of you that are curious, this is Yorkshire tea. It has a spoonful of sweetener in it and milk. And the hot tea basically not only lubricates my throat, but the heat kind of helps my chest loosen up. So that's always good. Now I am going to look and check these. And they're not quite done enough at this point. Gonna get a little bit longer. I might even say this is five to eight minutes per side, depending on the thickness of your meat.
guess that is a pupper who is smelling the cooking meat and he is now getting a little demanding. I might have my husband in the figure to do the scratch it. Welcome in, Professor Nels. Uh, you have got here for the chicken fried steak portion, and this is just cube steak uh, seasoned with salt and pepper. And then I put it into a seasoned flour with parsley and sage, salt and pepper, and then it goes into an egg dip and then into panko breading. And cooked on 350 degree oil. And that will then cook until it is well done. And I will take and make a cream pan gravy to go over the top of this. So it's chicken fried steak with gravy. We have got the pot pies in the oven already cooking. And this is how you get the filler of the chicken fried steak. <laughs> they had a really good sale at the grocery store on it. So that is why I decided to make chicken fried steak instead of just making two pot pies and doing them incrementally. So. Can we get a shout out for Professor Nels and for uh, uh, Bud? I took some of the breading off, oh well. So I am turning this over now to make sure I don't burn it. It will get turned back to finish. These end steaks are actually quite good. So, I've got good browning going on the first side. It will brown up pretty good on the second side, and then I'll flip it back to finish some of the unbrowned areas that I've got here. Just depends on where it is in the pan. And as you can see, I've got quite the size difference in here. Uh, you can actually take and add a little bit of salt and pepper at this point to it if you want to. Uh, I like to season it when it's done and on my plate because I don't know what the seasoning is across these and it's all the personal taste really. No problem. No problem for the shout out. Thank you so much for coming, Professor. Uh, I really enjoyed your stream last night. You you got it really going with those uh, TLD uh, stream there. You had some pretty darn good runs going. So. That was really enjoyable to watch. When I'm done with this, all these little brown bits that you see in here will add flavor to the gravy that I'm making. And uh, I just need to not have a whole cup of oil in here. I, I could actually make a whole lot of gravy. Don't really want to. Um, Just kind of looking at this and seeing where it's still got blood coming out and where it doesn't. So the larger pieces like this one and this and this are much less done than these. It's also these three were added in first. That's not done yet. You need to put it back in there. Uh, add a problem. Why don't you raise the temperature to 400 and um, let it get a little further brown. How long? Ten minutes. My pie crust is a little pale and sad looking, so we're going to add a little bit more time to it. My oven here in the uh, apartment we're in really isn't that good at uh, temperature gauging, so it's not always as hot as it needs to be. Okay. And let's see, uh, these will be finished with the um, a milk gravy, sort of a country gravy made on this. It won't have sausage in it, but it will have the milk and the cooking base from this, which will have beef flavor in it, and the seasonings from um, the flour. And I'm going to turn it back over now. And 
rotate them. Can I get a knife and fork so that I can cut into it when it's time to cut into it? adding some mushrooms to this because I love mushrooms, so I am going to be making it with mushrooms in the Set, which is a noise canceling headset. And what we've got instead is a boom mic. Ow! I'm going to be myself on the edge of this can. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
Spoonchula, my husband tells me. All right, now you mix this up till once again what you have is kind of a loose. I'm going to need another milk honey for this. It's not going to, I'm not going to have enough milk for this much gravy. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing because this will go really nicely over rice or noodles as well as going over the meat. Uh, classically, you would probably serve this with mashed potatoes and the gravy would go both on the meat and the potatoes, but uh, I'm not preparing an entire meal here. So, probably fill it to halfway honey. Now I am just cooking this so that the flour cooks and continually scraping it so I get more and more of the brown bits off the bottom. And this is how my grandmother taught me to make the milk gravy that went with her fried chicken. And oh, is that good. This is stick to your ribs, not at all. Um, low calorie stuff, but it is off, off tasty. This is the kind of stuff that uh, farm hands and the working men, construction workers would have. And this needs to cook for about five minutes to make sure that the flour is cooked so you don't have what tastes like raw dough in your mouth when you eat the gravy. I am going to season it a little bit right now. I am going to put in a little extra sage. So it's just a touch, maybe a quarter teaspoon. And then I am going to add some more parsley because parsley's good. And it's pretty. So that always makes things lovely too. And I'm not going to be silly about this and try to sprinkle it on. I'm just going to pour it in there. So I'm going to add about a teaspoon of parsley to this. And then I'm going to take a little bit of rosemary. You can see where the gravy is bubbling up. That's good. The pies are now coming out of the oven and they will sit for 10 minutes and then we will cut into one after I finish making my gravy and serve it up over steak. So, I've got the gravy bubbling and it's actually at a simmer, which is good for the gravy making. Flour has turned a little bit of color in here. It's gained some of the brown from the things. And I'm now going to add the milk. If you are lactose intolerant, you could just as easily make this with adding beef broth to it. But I am making 
making a more classic uh, country gravy to go over it, which is made with milk. You could actually make sausage with put sausage in this too to make it a full-on country gravy, and then you could take your leftovers and put them on biscuits. That's assuming you have leftovers. And this is adding about four cups of milk to this. steak. Well, one piece, the smallest one, has already disappeared. Andrew can type what he thought of it. You had a delight for dinner, but you want some sort of medium <laughs> in order to have gravy. Uh, so the pie is, no, it's not a side dish. I'm just making two different mains. I'm making the chicken fried steak because it is a meal that my father will eat. He doesn't really like pies and uh, he needs every calorie he can get. So I decided to make the country gravy with it and um, he's been losing weight steadily for three years and he really doesn't need to. He's getting very delicate and we need to stop that. He needs to eat more and he needs to eat more calories. And unfortunately, some of his medicines make it so he doesn't want to eat it, suppressed his appetite. So whenever, whenever I can, I try to uh, accommodate that and encourage him to eat um, more than his, I'll just have a half of a peanut butter sandwich thing and call that a meal. So he's a big guy. He's six feet tall, or he was before he started getting sort of hunched over. I'm going to turn the heat down a little bit now because the gravy is forming up. And it is getting nice and thick here. I'm going to actually turn the heat off because it's basically done once I get the thinner parts mixed in with the thicker parts and it will continue to thicken. I think you can see that it is a thick gravy now. You can see when I scoop it, it actually swoops aside. So this is now done. And I will take, there's my ladle. I will take this lovely gravy, which would go so good with so many things. And I am gonna give it a taste for seasoning. Needs a little bit of salt. So, here's my salt. I'm going to add a little bit of salt to it now. And like I said, you want to reserve your last of your seasoning to when you're actually done so that you know exactly how much all of your dish is combining in together. And as you can see, this is quite a thick gravy at this point. You can thin it easily with water or milk if it's too thick for your taste. But uh, we have got some real, oh, this is so yummy. That taste even under season was so yummy. It brings back my grandma so strongly. This was, this is a meal right up her line. Um, okay, so I have got that out of the way now and I will take a plate. Can you wipe that off real quick? Just wipe it. And
proper of you. Because you have short arms. I do have short little arms. And I am going to take and lay just a little line of gravy across the top, like that. And then I am going to have a piece cut so that people can see the inside and on the fork. And Doesn't that look tasty? Go ahead and take a good photograph of that if you would, sweetheart. Well, I'm pushing up some food. Come on, Dad. Do you want to have coffee? Yeah. On that one. And she does not get. Actually, this is for Dad. He's going to need to cut this. I'm going to put a little bit of gravy over the top of his. on the chicken fried steak. Another sip of my tea, which I'm going to set out of the way. And I will move this out of the way. And then take this, my thing here, and put... Did you cut a pie? No. Will bring me one of the pies so I can show everybody in a nice scoop for it, please. Ah, uh, he's eating this. <laughs> I can't say I blame him. I'm going to take a bite of it with the gravy as well so I can tell you all how fabulous it is. So I'm going to take a slice of the chicken fried steak. Where I need to put this. Okay, I'll move it out of the way. And there's one of the pies. I am going to show you guys this bite. And it is right here, all lovely and covered in gravy. Oh. That is so good. Now we have my finished chicken pot pie here. And the edges of the crust are golden. Uh, this took half an hour on 375 and then 10 minutes on 400 to get the pie crust completely done. And this is slightly bubbly and you can see the cheese through it. This is a light golden color with a deeper gold on the uh, filling on the, on the edges here. And I am just waiting for my husband to bring me uh, a scoop that I can use to get this piece out of here because it's not going to cut like a regular pie. The filling is liquid, and I need something to put it in like a bowl. But 
Oh, that chicken fried steak is so good. Spatula, and then I am going to use a scoop. He is cleaning up in here in the background. And again, this is a single crust pie. You could make it a double crust. I think you can see where the where the pie crust is flaky and it's coming apart there. The lovely buttery layers. I am going to serve this in a, no, I'm going to use a scoop on this because there's just no better way to do it. I can behave myself and wait. It's hard to wait though. This apartment smells so incredible. Really, really does. You've got the smell of the chicken fried steak, and you can smell the creaminess of the gravy. You can also smell the chicken and the cheese and the vegetables from the pot pie. up the crust but that's fine it's not going to be a pretty dish it's going to be the dish that tastes the best so I will transfer that into here ow that's hot Billy and then I will add some more of the filling around the edge here because it needs it I'm sorry you can't really see me plating this, but it's a messy process. All right. Now I am going to take and wipe the edge down as best I can and show you all. Here is the chicken pot pie, the cheesy cauliflower chicken pot pie. My husband is now going to take some pictures of it that I will post. And I am going to taste a little bit of the filling here, tell you how that turned out. So I am going to get some of the zucchini and one of the pieces of cauliflower and some chicken. You can taste the cheddar and the cheese. You can taste the fresh vegetables. The potatoes are cooked till they're tender. The, the chicken is seasoned and moist and the cheddar sauce and, and cauliflower runs through the whole thing. So it is absolutely amazing. And those are probably the only bites I'm going to have of these two pot pies since my husband claimed them for himself. He said that the cauliflower cheese recipe I based this on is from his mother, therefore it is her recipe and he gets it. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. I will have the recipes and I will have the uh, pictures posted up tonight. And <sighs> flag of the UK. Oh dear. 
He's trying to plant a flag across my screen. <laughs> I am going to look and see who is on that we can uh, raid. Thank you so much for being here, Professor. Thank you for being here, Tina. And thank you for those I don't see that uh, are here and have been watching. And all of you who are going to watch this for uh, Let's Raid Call Me Weevil because he is a chef. So there we go. Thank you again for coming and I hope you enjoy these recipes as much as I do and build your own memories.